Welcome to Hacking Business Technology, episode numero uno. I'd like to welcome our esteemed hosts, Farah Rentula, Mark Kawasaki, Matt Hooper, and myself, Mr. Matt Barron. I don't know why I put Mr. in front of my name instead of everyone else's name. You're actually over 30 now, Barron. <laughs> that, that's true. Okay. <laughs> now I have a title. A salutation, as they say, on form form based applications. So, welcome, welcome to the podcast. I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest today, Mr. J. Rod Green from Gartner Research. Gartner Inc. Yep. Gartner yep, Inc. Yep. Okay. Cool. So, J. J. Rod uh, has been working at Gartner for a long time. Uh, the the story that I like from J. Rod is that he used to be low level, like work in the streets, down in the weeds of Gartner, and then eventually just kept working his way up in the organization until he became an analyst. So, I love that the underdog story, man. That's what's up. You know, you know who else has a similar story? Not to put their business in the street, but my Doppler Gangler. Is Miss Courtney Bartlett at Forrester? Nice. She's done the same. She's done the same thing. So she's been she's been grinding, doing good stuff, and contributing to the space. So I love Courtney. She's fantastic. You know, you yeah. you very rarely see Evelyn without Courtney, and you very rarely see Glenn without Courtney. Right. They're they're a tight knit group. Those those Forrester guys. You very rarely see Carlos Casanova without Courtney. But we won't. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh. You're a director now too, right, Sharon? Yes, I am now a research director here at, mm -hmm. uh, at Gartner. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Very cool. So we're jumping in with questions. We got all kinds of them for you. One each, right? All right. Bring them on. Bring them on. Bring them on. Let's go. All right. So uh, speaking of your position over at Gartner, I think a lot of things that we're all used to seeing from that space um, is kind of research and analysis on things like IT service support management or um, there's a lot of IT, the service desk or the IT service desk. So uh, what's your view? Are we dropping the IT? Are we um, refocusing? <laughs> Are we refocusing view? What's coming down the pipeline? Um, it, it's interesting. So the, the, the drop in the IT bit came came out of the the conference we were at last week, but you, know, you go back and you look at like the way vendors have messaged things, and you could technically say BMC dropped the IT when they did you know BSM, right? So we we've been through this. This is a cycle. We're we're IT. We're we're always going to be IT. I just think the key is finding new ways or, or or finding interesting ways or finding ways to demonstrate better value to the business. And, and the takeaways I've, you know, received from customers over the past couple of years is that, you know, value is different strokes for different folks, right? So for some, value is keep the lights on, keep systems up, keep people happy, and that that's cool. For others, value is can you create things for us? Can you create applications? Can you create services? Can you allow us to work different? Can you help us collaborate? And the way you demonstrate value is is, is going to differ depending on your industry, your scope, your resources. But so as long as you you deliver that value, I don't even care if you call it service management at all. That that that's our goal is to to show value and how how we do it's going to change. Um, for most, how we do it stays the same. But we're we're going to be here. We ain't, we ain't going nowhere. We'll be talking ITSM in twenty years. Hmm. Should have just called the podcast value. Value. <laughs> there we go. Value. That's what it comes down to, right? I mean, whether you whether you define a framework for service management or not, it's hey, we spend money on this. What's what's the return? What's the value? What's what are we getting for that? And and how you demonstrate it just just really depends. So right. you know, I, I took a lot from the ESM and so yeah, it's just you demonstrating value. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you demonstrate value? What what have you done for me? What are you doing for me? You know, so. That's where we are. I think we'll be there for for the foreseeable future. <laughs> nice. Well, so, so I know we said one question, but a little just to close off that topic. And I think what's interesting to me um, about what you just <clears> said <throat> is that you know you know BMC might have done that before. We're coming back. We're hearing other vendors come out and say it. Um, are we just you know it's it's a cycle, but it doesn't seem like we're breaking out of that cycle. No, not. <laughs> Not quick. I mean, I just feel like we we're creatures of habit, 
right? We, we trust things that we've done before to do new things are very scary. So we need to always find, you know, some similarity or some connection to something of the past to explain what we're trying to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a really good example. So, so Matt and I had this conversation when we were at the show last week and, you know, people have taken the ARS platform from BMC and they've, they've built things, right? That, that's new. That's, that's not new is what I'm saying. And so to do it on, you know, ServiceNow isn't, isn't new, right? We've been using our ITSM apps to automate things and build and automate workflows for a long time. So when you say, well, what's the new element? Maybe the new element is that it's uh, as a service or it's in the cloud or we make it easy for anybody to be able to create these applications. But we're still there. We're still doing the same things, going, going back to value. So I think the messaging from the vendors is, is always going to try to you know, pull, a, pull something from the past to help you know, buyers and new buyers understand it. But the, the practices, the, the, the practitioners, the things we've been doing, the things you guys have been doing specifically, those things aren't going to go and aren't going to change. So, you know, hold, hold true to what it is you're using to demonstrate value, and you'll, and you'll be all right. And that's, that's the part that makes my job fun but frustrating at the same time. It's like we're having the same conversation over and over and over again. But Yeah, yeah I mean, I think if you, if you took a walk to the Met Museum in New York, you'll see manifest systems on papyrus sleeves back from you know, when they used to come down the Tigris River. I mean, so, we, you know, requests to fulfillment services are not <laughs> new, right? They're thousands and thousands of years old. It's just yeah. the degrees of scalability, right? Sure, sure. Put it on a mobile device or, you know, make it, make it easy for layman's to, to, to be able to create, but we're, we're, we're still there and we get it. And so, so much of the messaging is designed to, to sell software, right? I mean, at the end of the day, like, that's, that's what a vendor's message is to do, is to sell software. So... You know, keep that in mind when you talk about you know best practices and, and, and process refinement. Don't don't get caught up in the in, in the vendor message and the vendor hype. Stay stay true stay true to what it is you're doing to demonstrate value to your business. Love it, love it. So they always say you know be the change you want to see in the world. What what would you say needs to change in our world, Jaron? Like what what do you want to see change in the industry over the next year? Uh, you know what's really interesting, and I know we keep it like oh so super real on this podcast. Um, I I would love to see more color. I'd love to see more diversity. I'd I'd love to see more more women involved in the space. Um, you know I'm on the road a lot. I do a lot of these shows. I do a lot of conferences, and you know you you run into some of the same folks, right? And then when you run into some of the folks who would be the minorities in that scenario, right, African-Americans, uh, women, African-American women, very rare to see in this space, um, you tend to gravitate towards one another, right? There, there tends to be discomfort in that. And the conversation is usually the same one. It's, you know, why, what, what are some barriers that exist in this space for, for, for us to really have, have an impact here? So if I could wave a, a, a magic wand, I'd like to see uh, more minorities involved in the space, uh, more women involved in the space, more minority women involved in the space, because that's when you really start to open up opportunities to innovate, right? If there's the same sets of people at the table driving, driving innovation, you, you stagnate a little bit, right? Everyone has kind of a narrow perspective. You opening up that door and letting in a wave of people from different backgrounds, different races, different levels of education, different levels of experiences is really when you start to to unlock innovation. So not to say innovation is stifled at all, but when we really need to start cranking is when you, you see a more diverse set of people at the table. Love it. Love it. I do yeah. think innovation is stagnant. <laughs> I think yes, even right? when I was at South by Southwest, there was a lot of focus on um, bringing together diverse groups um, of just different skill sets as well. You know, yeah. bringing musicians and artists together with developers and having them run in the scrums with them and see what comes out of that. It's pretty interesting stuff. We yeah, need music day in IT. Bring a band to work day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw the Tar Hero last week, right? But I mean, at, at, at the end of it, I mean, it's all, it's all design, right? It's all, it's all how do we design, how do we design user experience? And you, you need artists at the table to, to have that conversation. So I, I could totally see why that, why that makes a lot of sense. I, I used to tease because um, when I went and got my MBA, uh, a few years ago, and like the first class we had was statistics, and um, the professor says, you know, I'm going to have you read a book, and it was by Daniel Pink, and it talked about 
uh, Masters of Fine Arts are the new MBAs, right? And so we're sitting there going, why, why the hell did you just tell I mean, we just sunk a bunch of money into this MBA. <laughs> And you're telling us the future's in fine arts. So thank, thanks a lot, Professor Jones. But, but what I think he was trying to, to get us to understand was that, you know, really the only things that differentiate are, are design-based. So we, we can automate a lot of things. We can offshore a lot of things. But true design and really creating things that are of value and are going to resonate in the world, that's, that's, a, that's a different kind of skill set. And that's when you have to think outside the IT box and now into this creative side of things and how you create them. We're starting to see it, right? We're starting to see how much design impacts buying cycles or how design affects the way we interact. So yeah, I could totally see why musicians and creative types are, are at the table when, when we need to start designing these things. That, that, that's awesome. Love it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got questions? Yeah, I got, I got a question for you, Gerard. So, uh, yeah, I, I've got to I've got to get a sense for where your head's at and where you know Gartner's thinking about this this whole DevOps movements. I, I mean, I'm I'm so excited about the continual traction it seems to get. Um, you know, just even this past conference, acknowledged there was tracks there and Gene Kim's there again. It's just it's just really exciting. But you know, when when does it really hit a level of acceptance and, until it gets you know a Forrester or a Gartner? Analyst associated to it, it still seems cursory in some ways. I mean, are, are you guys are you guys accepting it, and is it still just an interest? No, we we we've been on the we've been on the DevOps track for for a while now, for as long as I you know can, can remember, and I've only been in the analyst role for four years. Um, you know, we've had George Baffert talking to folks about DevOps. We've had Cameron Haight talking to folks about DevOps. We've had you know Ronnie Colville talking about application. Release automation. We've, we've had folks talking about broader collaboration uh, in IT, which is really the root root of DevOps, right? Co collaboration across those those groups. We've um we've put a good amount of attention on, it, and I think generally speaking, what you see is you know our Type A, Type B, Type C organizations. The Type A's are going to move. Type A's are going to jump on it. Type A's don't tend to wait for the Gartners, or the Foresters, or the other kind of research firms of the world to validate it. They're they're going to move. And they're they're going to innovate. And they're going to push. Type Bs are going to wait for Type As to you know make mistakes and, and then go adopt, and then Type Cs are going to come at the end, and by then it's too late. But then they can you know pick some of this stuff up, because I just think that's the general mix that you see across the board. So whether we talk about it, Forrester talks about it, you're going to have organizations that are a little more you know risk adverse, and no matter what you know Gartner says to validate it, they're they're going to have some hesitation. So you know, we've been writing about it for a long time, and I'm you know I'm certainly not the expert there. But um, you know, it's something we 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 pushed into our, our talk track. We pushed into our our messaging. Um, one of the things that I like about the way we approach the DevOps concept is to say, listen, there's different strokes for different folks. Different types of systems require different management frameworks. And so, for some systems, a DevOps methodology or DevOps you know framework makes sense. And then for other systems of record, maybe maybe ITIL makes a lot of sense. We're not one to say one framework is better than another. We're wanting to say, take these frameworks, take a look at them all, take a look at them all at the same time, and then see what makes sense for you given the resources you have and the requirements you have to meet. Um, it's almost like a cookbook, right? You, you, you want to take a recipe, but if you're allergic to peppers, then don't put peppers in the, in the <laughs> meal, right? So we want to make sure, that, you know, it's not a prescription. You must follow or, you know, idle versus DevOps versus CMMI versus cook wrong conversation. It's, it's what pieces of these frameworks are going to allow you to go back to value. So it, it's a conversation we've had for a long time. And, you know, I'd love to, you know, work with you guys to get you in front of the, the Gartner folks who are, who are really driving thought leadership there in, in, in absence of, you know, real broader market adoption. Because we'll keep, we'll keep beating that drum. Yeah, just as a follow-up on that, because one of, you know, I, I, I've heard a lot of people say what you said, which is you have to pick the pieces that work for you. But unfortunately, what I see in practice is that some people will pick certain things, but they don't pick some of the core elements that actually matter. Like at the end of the day, we can talk about our business agility, we can talk about all the things that we're delivering, but you know, for those in IT operations, we manage assets. 
Yeah. Simple. That's just what we do. So if you don't have an asset management strategy, you know, your, your ability to release quickly and your ability to make agile changes or do agile software development lifecycle all fall apart because yeah. you don't have that foundation. So if you didn't pick that because you're like, well, we don't want to get bogged down by process. Yeah. Uh, hard. Yeah. When, when you buy stuff and you have to stick it in some place, you kind of need a process for that. So. Yeah. You know, I think someone has to step up and say, hey, listen, all these things are good at, at, the, at the cursory level. We can decide whether we want you know, self-service portals and all these other things and what works for us and do we need change approvals for request management. And, you know, that's fine to pick and choose, but at some level, some things you can't choose not to do, right? Because yeah. at, at the core, like, you know, configuration management, some of those core things, you're just never going to get to agility without it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think I would agree with you on a certain extent. You know, I, I was hearing some of the speakers and, and talking to some folks um, even just last week, and it was an interesting approach where they said, you know, some of our biggest success in venturing out into more of the business service management or enterprise service management or whatever you want to call it was less focus on, on increasing maturity or having some of the, you know, traditional have a strong config management process in place and a strong this and that. He said, we got the basics up and running, and then we said there was more value for us to deepen the maturity of our processes with, with regards to HR and facilities than there was in me spending time refining how IT is going to sit there and manage 30 attributes against a server. So it was, it was an interesting take where they said, we're not even going to bother with maturing our ITSM processes, and, and that's kind of that's scary for some people to think about, but it was an interesting a take where they said, for us, we want to be more strategic. We want to fix HR's recruiting and interviewing process. Uh, we want to fix the way with which you know facilities manages their um, their stuff because moves, you know, office moves cost us more in, in inefficiency yeah. than it does within IT. Yeah, yeah. it goes back to that value, right? I mean, it just goes back to how do we demonstrate? And before it was, we had all these management processes to stabilize the environment. And if the environment's stable then everyone can go do their job, right? The applications are up, services are up, everybody's cool. But then the minute around, it's like, how do we advance and help those processes? To your point, how do we go into an HR process and say, you don't have to have 30 steps to this. We can, we can cut this down. We can simplify. We can streamline is how that group chooses to demonstrate value. So it's, it's really getting out of your own way sometimes to be able to, to have that conversation. So that's, that's where mixing those frameworks become become important. It's the same answer to the first question. Diversify. Like yeah. even, don't even think yeah. IT, just think all value, everything all in one <clears throat> big bucket. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I've said to people several times, I said, if you are still at the point where you have to tell the business partners how valuable you are, you're not valuable. And if I have to tell you how, how up your systems are and, and you know, what SLAs are, then I'm not valuable because either I'm providing value to you and you know it intrinsically and you're seeing the outcomes, we're talking about the benefits that we've jointly built together, or I'm talking about still proving myself to you. Trying to justify. You know, like I don't, you know, you don't tell your wife, you, you know how awesome I am? <laughs> I have to remind her sometimes because she does <laughs> yeah. I have to remind you every day of how awesome I am, like we have a problem. So just, it's the same scenario. Like if you, if you show up and you do the things you're supposed to do, you don't have to have that conversation. Like I always come back to like the relationship element, and that, that's what he actually right. Like if you got to justify every single day, it's just like, uh, I don't know if that relationship's sustainable. I yeah. told my wife it would take me six months to get a dashboard and the KPIs. <laughs> I got I got to look at the process. Baron Baron bought a Google Google goggles so that she he could display the value every three microseconds. At every day, red, yellow, green in real time, <laughs> with metrics that only Matt understands. Which is like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for Mother's Day it's location based, and she's, she's telling him, "Yeah, you're in the red still, wrong store." <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, my question is more around around this value. It, yes, value is different to different groups and different people, but there is still a shift going on, and value is is more on the innovation side as we look to the future. It's just inevitable with, you know, the commoditization of of things in, in IT and the cloud and all this sorts of thing. So what what Gerard, what would you tell businesses if all of infrastructure and operations was gone? If that was in the cloud, if it was just not part of their 
their internal business model. What, what, where do they find success then? How do they become strategic? Um, what is IT's role in that? What's left? I mean, wh where do you see that going? And does Gartner have a role in that? Will you be serving more business side than IT side in the future? Yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the interest in taking that is to say, to say, okay, what if the business didn't leverage internal IT at all? Because that's what it would be. If we're not leveraging the internal IT department, we need IT from somewhere. So we're going to go to separate providers to get it. We're going to go to, you know, Amazon, or we're going to go to Google, or we're going to go to Salesforce, and we'll, we'll just kind of deal with it ourselves. No, no and one chooses those. They all choose IBM or HP, the old iron shop. The old iron cloud, but I mean, that's, that's what people think. That when, when you look at business model, though, the business model for Salesforce was go directly to Salesforce, get IT out the way. Mm -hmm. So I, IT, IT's in the way. You need to close deals. We got an app for that. Like, that's the whole model. So on some level, there's still that reliance on IT. It's just not us. It's just not the internal IT. It's just not the people we've been dealing with. So then the takeaway is how do you as an IT organization market yourself the same way Salesforce does, market yourself the same way Amazon does, market yourself the same way Google does, because someone's got to have a conversation about service level agreements. Someone's <laughs> got to have a conversation about penalties. Somebody's got to have a conversation about uptime. And at the same time, there's, there's hardware to be managed somewhere, right? There's downtime, right? There's things that the provider has to do to manage IT as a service. So I think the biggest, the biggest takeaway here is saying, well, how do you operate IT like a business so that you can compete with those guys? Because they have sales staff, too. They got margin that they got to protect, too. And so you need to be able to have a conversation about the value, again, the value, that you bring to the table against the value that a provider can bring. You have to have your, your, your service costing model together. You have to have a, a value statement together. You, you have to, to talk the same talk that these you know, mega vendors are, are talking to be able to have a seat at the table. Because IT, you can't, you can't decouple it, right? It's, it's IT. It's just going to be their stuff or your stuff. I'd much rather it be your stuff. Yeah, I, I think to go with that as well, you need technically minded folks in the business that are able to orchestrate all these external providers into an innovative solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I always use the example. Right? So it's, it's service management integration versus service management in itself. Now you have your techies and your business techs serving that integration function and going, how can I leverage, how can we, you know, take this they're, they're worried about the day-to-day -day stuff. Now let me take this and take it yeah. up a notch at the analytical. Yeah. And, also, and also focusing on design. You know, strategy and design are two of the life cycles in ITO, at least, but we never focus on them when we talk about ITSM. So how can IT be part of that conversation and not just keep the lights on, but actually do something radical that's going to yeah. make a difference on the business side? Talk about what to do when the lights are on. So the lights are on. Yeah. Is that all you wanted? If you just wanted... The light's yeah. on, then cool, but they're on, so do something. And here's how we see opportunities where you can move yeah. into new markets or you can expand the use of things. Like that's the conversation we haven't, able, we haven't been able to have because we're so busy keeping the lights on. So I, I think, again, there's just opportunities, massive opportunity um, to leverage some cloud providers to get scale that we've never had before, but now... Now you have to show and prove. Now, now you have to have a conversation about what you can do different than what a service provider could can do. That's, that's yeah. a tough conversation for folks to have. I mean, yeah. look at Borders, Borders Books and Music kept the lights on until they couldn't anymore. And I mean, yeah, let's see. Blockbuster video. <laughs> yeah. Blockbuster video. Exactly. Innovator die, right? Right. It, well, innovate or die, there you go. But and, and I think a big part of that, too, is you mentioned Daniel Pink earlier um, with your MBA class, and I go back to that same book uh, by Daniel Pink with The Whole New Mind. And before mm -hmm. it was people were fearful of losing jobs to, you know, the outsourcing call center jobs to, to the countries out east. Well, now, if you think about it um, in terms of what tools are allowing you to do, it's forget the offshore folks, right? The reality is, is that our business user are more tech savvy today. Mm. They, you know, we have to learn to trust them. And if we learn to build a culture of trust, you know, think of the Wikipedia. I mean, it's it's the Wikipedia still worked out. So why are we so fearful and say no? We have to control knowledge. We have to control these processes. Let the people out there 
be more organic. Let that see what they come back with. If I have a hundred forms that are doing the same thing, eventually whichever one's used the most will be the one that becomes the actual, right. you know, the one that takes over. But then that allows us all of that free time now. We have now supported or, or created a space to innovate. And I think right. people don't realize that. You know, they we used to back in the day, ITIL Foundation, we used to I remember telling my my uh, my students when I was teaching problem <clears throat> management, you know, all of you are focused on reactive problem management, but imagine where you were preventing the fire instead of fighting it. And now we're at a space where finally we have serve with cloud technologies and all the services we have, they're doing the firefighting for you and now people are going how on earth do we prevent fires? I mean, they're just, just blown away by the opportunities yeah. they have to be proactive. Yeah. I run into a set, and, and I'm not saying this is everyone, but I, I think there's a set out there that doesn't know how to exist in a world without fires, right? Because if, if there are no fires, I don't, I don't have an opportunity to show you how awesome I am to put fires out. So, you know, you, you, I always try to get in the mindset of the person who says, well, we, we can't do a crowdsourced wiki approach to knowledge management because we do the knowledge management. You can't you can't trust the people because what if they, you know, share bad information with each other? And I said, whether you put up the wiki or not, or whether you manage the space or not, you don't think people are talking about IT services around you? You don't think people instant message each other or send emails or, or fire up Google Plus Hangouts to talk about what's happening on this screen? And you get this real weird look from them like, yeah, I guess they are, but what do I do now? So if that's a space where I'm not valuable as a firefighter, what, what kind of skills do I need to pick up? So I'm always trying to, to be conscious of that mindset of the person who stands up and says, no, we can't do that. We've never done that, and that'll never work. It's really a lot of fear there, and yes. we have to work to, to empower these people to, to learn new skills, to to learn how to have a conversation with the business so that it doesn't become something that puts them in a spot where they're going to have to go anyway, right? You're, you're going to have to go. So you, you innovate or you, you, you go. I won't say and that. that's how you hack business technology. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks, J-Rod, for being the first guest. Thank you to my lovely co-host, co and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. See you.